This video is supported by Brilliant. All right, thanks for coming in. Please, have a seat. Glad to be here. So uh, we appreciate your interest in the NASA astronaut program. Um, you know, this interview is just a little chance to look at your qualifications, get to know who you are, and kind of learn a little bit about you. And um, is, is this your qualifications? You're looking at it. It just says, I've seen the movie Space Camp 87 times. That's, that's literally all it says. Why waste ink, am I right? This is this is your only qualification. There's no piloting experience, no engineering degree. Just you've seen the movie Space Camp, eighty-seven times. S so did did you actually go to Space Camp or? Why would I go to Space Camp? I've seen the movie, eighty-seven, 87 times. Times, yeah, yeah. You you mentioned that. Look, kids, they go to real Space Camp. They play around in simulators. That's cute. But do they know what to do? When there's thermal curtain failure, do they know how to handle that? Do they know how to get extra oxygen from Space Station Daedalus? Or, or how to do Morse code through the comm link when it goes down? Right. Well, thermal curtain failure isn't really a, a thing. And even if it was, we don't fly the space shuttle anymore. And Daedalus never existed, like, at all, so... I'm sorry, what's your point? <laughs> My point is that it doesn't look like there's really any place for you in our astronaut program today. Sorry. Well, what about here on the ground? Could I could I work with the you know the sentient robots here at Johnson Space Center? The the what? Yeah, the sentient robots, like Jinx. Jinx with Maximum Space? Oh oh there there's no sentient robots here or anywhere in the world, actually. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on, hold on a second. So, no thermal curtain failure, no jinx, no Daedalus. <laughs> Wait, you trying to tell me that the movie Space Camp is not real? Or are you telling me you think it is real? <laughs> I know it's not real. Just when I was a kid, I wanted to be an astronaut, like, more than anything in the world. It's, it's all I wanted to be. My parents couldn't afford to send me to actual space camp, so I just watched the movie over and over and over again. I wanted to know everything there was to know about that movie. Like that scene where NASA's trying to communicate with them through Morse code, and Tish is realizing that they're communicating. If you look on her left hand, the fingernails are a slightly different color than in the scene before that, because it turns out they had to reshoot that scene, because Kelly Preston had to go to her cousin's wedding in Wabash, Wisconsin, like the week before that, and she had to change her you know, fingernail color to match her, what her you know, bridesmaid's dress. And then when they got back, the uh, system makeup person, Tracy Pinkerton, uh, this was the only movie she ever worked on, but they couldn't find the same color anymore, so she had to get some press-on nails and put them on there, and they were close, but they were just a little bit, a little bit different. Wow. The point is, I just, I felt like if I knew everything there was to possibly know about this movie, then I could forget that I was never actually gonna be an astronaut. That my dreams were just gonna vanish and go away, like the kid who played Max, right? Just never heard from again. Wasn't that Joaquin Phoenix? It was! The kid who played Max was Joaquin Phoenix. What? On July 8th of 2011, the Space Shuttle Atlantis took off from Kennedy Space Center on its way to the International Space Station carrying four passengers. One of those passengers was pilot Doug Hurley. Little did he know he was going to be on the very next flight from American soil. Or that that flight was going to take nine years to happen. But alas, it did happen, as anybody watching this should know, when Doug Hurley and Bob Behnken took off last week on the SpaceX Demo-2 mission on the Crew Dragon capsule as part of NASA's commercial crew program, marking not just the end of the longest dry spell of crewed U.S. launches in NASA's history, but the very first crewed launch by a private space company. I mean, seriously though, how crazy is that? He was on the last shuttle mission and now he was on this one. It was like this weird bookend thing, like, was that done on purpose? I don't know. This is a huge deal. 
And it's even more impressive that SpaceX was able to do it before Boeing, because Boeing's been working with NASA for over 50 years. SpaceX just launched their first payload into space just a little over 10 years ago. So seriously, congratulations to the SpaceX team and Gwen Shotwell and Elon on this spectacular achievement. It really illustrates more than anything else that we are in an entirely new era of spaceflight. One where multiple private companies ferry astronauts back and forth to the ISS and possibly some private space stations while NASA is actually creating a base on the moon. That is going to require more astronauts. Want to be one of them? The job title of astronaut is one of the most exclusive jobs in the whole world. Only 339 people have been chosen for NASA's astronaut corps since it first started in 1958. The first seven astronauts were of course the Mercury 7 astronauts and the process for picking them was a long and grueling ordeal because they were really looking for people that had all seven were test pilots in the Air Force and Navy with engineering backgrounds that were picked out of an original pool of 508 pilots. And they were chosen based on their piloting skills, their mental aptitude, personality, and let's just say their ability to make America look good. We were in a space race at the time. I detailed that process in a video I made about Alan Shepard. I'll, I'll link it up here. The only physical requirement for these astronauts, other than, you know, not having a body riddled with tumors and having all of your hands and feet, was that you had to be under 5 foot 11 because the Mercury capsule was famously small. As John Glenn once said, you don't climb in the Mercury capsule, you put it on. So take that, talls. The Mercury 7 began the tradition of choosing candidates in groups. After the Mercury 7 were the new 9 in 1962, the 14 in 1963, which is where many of the Apollo pilots came from. The group in 1965 stepped away from the test pilots for the first time and focused on scientists, which is why they called themselves the scientists. Future groups would come up with more interesting names like the hairballs, the flying escargots, the chumps, and the maggots. 22 astronaut groups have been picked over the years with the first female candidate picked in 1978. Over the years, the groups have become more diverse um, and focus more on engineers and scientists and doctors and whatnot, but still 61% of all astronauts have come from the military. The next group of candidates is gonna be picked in 2021, and if you would like to be one of them, well, you missed your shot, because they, they took applications in March. I could have timed this video a little better. If it makes you feel better, your chance of getting picked for the astronaut corps is pretty slim. Since 1958, five times more people have been struck by lightning than have been picked to be an astronaut. And that's not for lack of applicants. The last round that they picked in 2017, there were 18,000 applications and 12 people were picked. That is a 0.06% chance of being chosen. But yeah, for this last round of applications, these were the requirements that NASA was looking for. Be a US citizen, possess a master's degree in a STEM field, including engineering, biological science, physical science, computer science, or mathematics from an accredited institution. And by the way, the master's degree thing is apparently new this year. Apparently before that, you only had to have a bachelor's degree. So they may be actually getting more stringent in the qualifications, but I don't know that for sure. I just got that from a website called uh, Ykaipedia. The master's degree equivalent can also be met by two years of work towards a doctoral program in a related science, technology, engineering, or math field, a completed doctor of medicine or doctor of osteopathic medicine degree, and completion of a nationally recognized test pilot school program. You must also have at least two years of related professional experience obtained after the degree completion, or at least a thousand hours pilot in command time on jet aircraft. So clearly test pilots are still preferred. Basically you have to have, you know, a graduate degree and two years of experience in that field, or you can be a test pilot. You also have to be able to pass NASA's long duration flight astronaut physical, which includes 2020 correctable vision in each eye, blood pressure not to exceed 140 over 90 measured in a sitting position, and the candidate must have a standing height between 62 and 75 inches. Candidates should also have communication, teamwork, and leadership skills, so any experience that shows that is obviously a plus. NASA's astronaut selection board goes through the applications and picks out the top candidates, and then those are actually brought into NASA's Johnson Space Center for interviews and further testing. And about half of those are brought back for second interviews, and then out of those, the final candidates are picked. So congratulations, you made the highly improbable cut. So what happens next? What happens next is two years of training at Johnson Space Center, during which they must complete military water survival training, become scuba qualified to prepare for spacewalk training, pass a swimming test during their first month of training, be exposed to problems associated with high and low atmospheric pressures and altitude chambers and learn how to deal with emergencies relating to those conditions, be exposed to space microgravity with flights in a modified jet aircraft, and to make the final cut, potential astronauts must satisfactorily complete training in the following. International space station systems, extravehicular activity skills, robotic skills, aircraft flight readiness, and the Russian language. 
Am I the only one that thinks it would be really fun to see the looks on the astronauts' faces if you could go back in time to the 1960s and tell them that in the year 2020, one of the requirements for being a NASA astronaut is knowing how to speak Russian? But how much money do they make? I mean, nobody becomes an astronaut to get rich, but you know, people gotta eat. Civilian candidates become federal employees, which means they get paid by the federal government's general schedule. Astronauts are on the GS-13 and GS-14 schedules, which means it's somewhere between 78,000 and 120,000, depending on experience and education and whatnot. Now, as many of you have probably noticed, I've only talked about NASA's qualifications to become an astronaut, but according to some research that I've done, just some, some facts that I ran across here, um, th there are other countries in the world. And many of them have their own space agencies and their own astronaut programs, and all of them have different qualification levels. I won't be able to get into all of them, but if you're from one of these countries and you think you've got the right stuff, here's a quick lay of the land. First and foremost is the Russian State Space Corporation, or Roscosmos, and I do need to do a full video on these guys. Obviously, they have a long history as pioneers of space flight, but in the last decade, they've become the ride to the International Space Station. Over the years, there have been 213 cosmonauts, including the ones from the Soviet era, Roscosmos, and the Intercosmos program, where they train astronauts from other countries. The European Space Agency, or ESA, has been around since 1975 and is a joint effort involving space agencies from 13 different European countries. They've produced a total of about 35 astronauts. The Canadian Space Agency, that produced everyone's favorite space rock star, Chris Hadfield. Then Japan Space Agency, JAXA. China, only the third space agency that actually launches their astronauts with the Shenzhou program. China, unsurprisingly, is a bit isolationist and not involved with the ISS, so they want to build their own space station. Might also deserve a video. The United Arab Emirates launched their astronaut program in 2017 and already have put a couple of astronauts on the space station. Korea's space program has one astronaut, Yi so Yeon, who flew to the ISS on Soyuz in 2008. And the Israeli Space Agency had one astronaut, Ilyan Ramon, who tragically died in the Columbia in 2003. And one astronaut flew to the ISS from Malaysia in 2007. And India, Vietnam, and Mexico have astronaut programs but haven't sent anyone into space yet. Now there is one more state agency that's worth talking about. Uh, it's brand new and it's from here in the United States. It's the United States Space Force. They are actually starting an astronaut program, but they'll probably be pulling people out of the military for that. Now, obviously, there are a lot more national space agencies around the world. These are the ones with astronaut programs. And as you can see, most of these agencies just train astronauts. They don't actually fly them up. Only three space agencies in history have actually launched astronauts up into space. That's the US, Russia, and China. China does their own thing. As I just said a second ago, you can't buy a seat on the Shenzhou program, nor would you really want to. It's still kind of experimental at this point. And since the end of the shuttle program, it's been all Russia. They have been the one ride to space for all of these different agencies that I just mentioned since 2011, which is why the Demo-2 mission is such a big deal. For the first time in almost a decade, there's a second ride to space. And when Boeing gets their Starliner certified in the next year or so, there'll be three rides to space. Possibly four when Orion gets up there with the Artemis program. And we really shouldn't count out Sierra Nevada Corp's Dream Chaser space plane. They're part of the same commercial crew program as the Crew Dragon and Starliner. They plan to start doing cargo missions to the ISS in the next year, with crewed missions in the next five years if possible, and they've contracted with ULA to fly on their Vulcan rocket. Bottom line, if you want to be an astronaut, go be a military test pilot. <laughs> that still seems to be the best way in. Outside of that, getting a master's degree in a STEM field like biological sciences, physical sciences, or engineering. Or relevant experience in those fields. So, you know, you might want to go work for a company that's working on satellites or robotics that might actually put you in a good position for those construction jobs that might come later on. Or you could just make a metric butt ton of money and buy your way in. Good luck. Of course, if you want to be an astronaut, you might want to familiarize yourself with the rocket equation, which you can learn in the classical mechanics course on Brilliant. This course walks you through the fundamental concepts of matter in motion, why things move the way they do, how we can affect that movement, and basically develop a newer, better understanding of the natural world, with a focus on energy and momentum, reference frames, and more. Everything you need to know to understand movement in space. This is, of course, just one of dozens of classes on Brilliant, where you can learn everything from quantum mechanics to computational biology, or just bone up on algebra, and if you're smarter than me, calculus. You can go as basic or advanced as you want, and you can do it through solving problems, which trains your brain to think like a scientist and gives you problem-solving skills that you can apply to everything in your life. Plus, there are daily challenges, little problems to flex your brain every day to keep those brain muscles going. They can be downloaded on your phone so you can take it with you on the go, or just do it right from your browser. 
Brilliant really is an awesome way to learn things because it just does it differently than classical book learning. It you know teaches you problem solving skills and lets you kind of do it in the way that makes sense to you. So I can't recommend it enough. And if you're one of the first 200 people that sign up at brilliant.org slash answers with Joe and sign up for their premium subscription that gives you access to all of their courses, you can get 20% off your subscription for life. If you haven't tried out Brilliant, I suggest you try it out. I really think you'll like it. Brilliant.org slash answers with Joe. Links down in the description. Big thanks to Brilliant for supporting this video and a huge shout out to the Answer Files on Patreon. They're helping me to build a team, forming an awesome community. I love you guys. You're helping out so much. You have no idea. We got some new people. I got to murder their names real quick. I got a lot to get through, so let's see how fast I can do it. Uh, Denise Bledsoe, Donna Tos Lykius, James Truelove, Christopher G. D. McDonald, Christopher Humphrey, Kristen Drake, uh, Michael J. Corson, Juan Broderick Klein, Flynn Marshall, Anito Brakshevik, uh, Matthew Callahan, Tom Pope, Robert Gray, Evelyn Downs, Sparit Spartanitis, <laughs> Trevor Smith, Scott Brady, Jacob Brunberg, Joe Oliver, Hedrick the Brave, Randy Parrish, Ord, Jamie Robinson, William Hughes, Mackenzie Smith, Cheryl, Cheryl Diane, Outer Strain, Devin Miles, and Martin Zenwick. All right, not too bad. Uh, thank you guys so much. If you would like to join them, join an awesome community, get early access to videos and exclusive live streams, all kinds of fun stuff, you can go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. Please do like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, Google thinks you'll like that one. Don't let Google down. Go check it out. Uh, or check out any of these others down here that have my face on them. And if you enjoy them and you like what I do, I invite you to subscribe. I come back with videos every Monday. T-shirts available at the store, answerswithjoe.com slash store. I thought this was relevant. You got the little astronaut right there. Uh, lots of fun stuff, nerdy T-shirts. They support the channel. They support a great designer over in Prague. So definitely go check it out. See if you like something. All right, that's it. You guys go out there. Have an eye-opening week. Stay safe. And I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.